Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Wesley Schultz, and uh, I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker today, Winifred Lewis. Uh, Winifred Lewis is Associate Professor in the School of Psychology at the University of Queensland in Australia. Her research is in intergroup relations and conflict, political decision-making, norms, attitudes, and behavior. Many of these topics are very familiar to us in this group and to environmental psychology more generally. Among her long list of publications are papers on the usual suspects of recycling, water conservation, environmental activism, and identity, but also some unusual topics, uh, at least for environmental psychologists, such as pirating, whitewashing, and social neuroscience. She's a dedicated teacher with publications in the area of pedagogy, and in 2011, she won the UK award, sorry, UQ award, <laughs> for teaching excellence. She is a creative thinker and a skilled researcher, as I'm sure that you'll see from her talk today. Her talk is entitled, Unprecedented Disasters and Environmental Emergencies, What the Rise of Right-Wing Populism Means. So it gives me pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Winifred Lewis. Thanks very much, Wes. It's really an honor to be here. It's an honor to be giving a keynote. And I know that you, like me, would like to thank the organizers for putting on what has been a fabulous conference. So let's have a round of applause for them. I've been really inspired by the talks that I've seen so far, but my mission today is not to inspire you, it's to depress the heck out of you. So I think I'll find that quite easy, beginning with my title. <clears throat> but um, it's interesting, in the program, of course, the title is given as what it means, and we cut off the part for transitions towards sustainability and what we should do next. I am going to have a little bit of positivity in my talk. So who am I? I'm a former Canadian, but I'm based in Australia now. I'm based at the School of Psychology at the University of Queensland, which is a large research active um, institution. I'm 15 years and about 100 papers into my career, which I like to think means that you should trust me. And if you don't trust me for that reason, maybe you should trust me because I've been a long-standing activist, including for the environment. I've put my email on the slide there, and I'd like to say I really welcome your feedback. I know there won't be many times much time for questions because we're right up against the lunch break and who's going to want to stay and talk about right-wing populism. I co-authored on my talk Kelly Fielding, who's sitting over here, um, who is the inspiration for my research in this area and who collaborated with me and made sure that the work actually made sense for the uh, most of the papers we'll be talking about, and Joanne Smith, who's um, the lead on most of my papers on norms. And in preparation for the talk, I realized I probably could also have co-authored Emma Thomas, who's worked with me on a lot of the work on environmental radicalism, uh, radicalism and radicalization, which I'll be telling you a little about today. I'm going to talk about norms throughout the, res the research and the talks. And um, I use, by norms, social rules or standards for behavior. I'm also going to talk about identities, people's sense of themselves and who they are, and I tend to focus on social identities, like we saw in Emo's brilliant keynote yesterday. So fantastic. So I'm talking about people's sense of who they are as group members, you know, staff members, environmental psychologists, students, activists, green voters. That's what, how I'm using the term. And I'm going to be pitching to you the idea that just as from the 1960s on, environmentalists realized they needed to learn about the carbon cycle and carbon pollution to be able to address environmental concerns. Now, 50 years later, there is something that we all need to learn about that we didn't know about, and that is groups, and groups in conflict in particular. So I really endorse everything that Emo said yesterday in his keynote. Love that model, think it's great. And my own approach is to look at groups in conflict specifically, and I'm gonna be focusing today on how partisan conflict is really constraining, and in some cases, derailing progress towards environmental sustainability and what we need to do about that. The rise of right-wing populism has seen new conservatives coming to power in Europe, in the UK, in the US, and elsewhere around the world, including in Australia. I've um, talked about some of the themes around this in a TED talk that I'm gonna be revisiting the material today. I'm gonna to say we need to come to grips with this. We need to come to grips with what it means 
for our agenda if we can't allow the right wing to come to power, and I'm going to say that's unsustainable. We can't have sustainability that doesn't include right wing environmentalists. And that's going to be a challenge for us on so many levels, right? The slides from today will be posted online. It says are, but they will be um, posted online at my website, which is socialchangelab.net. And I'm hoping I can whiz through 50 slides in what I originally thought was an hour, but has now turned out to be 45 minutes. What could go wrong, right? So don't take time to write notes. My notes will be available. And because I often run out of time at the end of talks at the best of times, I'm going to say my take-home messages right now. Here are my take-home messages. <laughs> Stop demonizing right-wing people, not because it's not morally okay and fun, which it is, but <laughs> because it's counterproductive and it's creating a barrier in sustainability. Right-wing environmentalists exist, although they may be invisible to many of us, and in fact, they're really effective and valued, and we need to understand that as scientists, and we need to study them as scientists, which we haven't been doing. We need to support incremental change and mobilize coalitions and provide the evidence basis that allows people to be persuaded about the importance of that. I'm going to try and do some of that today for you folks. And then as scientists, I'm going to say, <clears throat> I heard a great talk today um, by Hen, I think the last name is Hen, um, about the sampling biases in the environmental move, uh, psychology. They are rampant, and the biggest one is that we are missing conservatives, because our convenient samples of students um, tend to have them not be attracted. Our convenient samples of people who want to do volunteer work on environmental projects um, don't recruit conservatives, and then they tend to drop out in the middle of our studies. So this is a serious issue. Many of you would have data where you can look at political orientation as moderators of the effects that you're already studying. I think it's great to do that, and if you find that the effects don't hold or look different for conservatives, I really think we should, should publish those null findings and those backlash effects. They're really important in progressing our agenda. Paulo Freire has this riff about how um, people should participate in denunciation and enunciation. We need to both identify the problem and celebrate and identify solutions. And that's what I'll be talking about today, but really it's much more than my agenda. I hope it will become something that interests you as well. And a particular bugbear is that we can't equate right-wing voters with lefties that are less intelligent or less educated or more morally defective. So we need to really understand what it is that's drawing them. It's often not a concern about the environment. They're voting right-wing for other reasons. But because it has enormous consequences when they come to power, we'll need to engage with that. OK, so now I've said a variety of controversial things without a shred of evidence. I'm going to just keep doing that for the next 50 minutes. But I will be presenting some studies. I won't be focusing on methods for the most part. All of my papers are available on ResearchGate, and the ones that aren't available there, you can email me and I'll send them to you. I'm going to focus on the results um, primarily. Let's start off with the idea that there are many different ways we could be progressing environmental sustainability towards transformation in our society. You could be part of an institutional campaign. You could go to rallies. You could climb the Opera House in Sydney and Australia and put up a sign about the need for climate treaties. You could bicycle naked through the streets. You know, that's a thing. So people are raising awareness about our vulnerability to climate change and dependence on fossil fuels. You could paint yourself green and say, go vegan. I'm persuaded. Or you could um, be part of the Sea Shepherds in Australia. You could be blockading the whaling vessels of Japan. So why is there such diversity of tactics? Well, partly because there's actually quite a big challenge in social transformation. So Klandermans and Wigema put forward this model in the 90s, and I'm adding uh, the fifth one. You know, if we want to change society, first we have to make them aware of a problem. Then we have to build sympathy for their um, uh, support for our, our solution. We need them to have intentions for policy support or for personal change. Then we need them to take action. And I'm going to add in this talk, we need, them, we need them to stop our opponents or win them over so they don't counter-mobilize. So these tactics, if we go back to them, have different um, purposes. You know, some might draw attention to an issue and raise awareness. Some might build sympathy. Some might perhaps help to translate um, sympathy to intentions. And all of these are really needed. When we look at what scientists do, what our tactic is in progressing environmental sustainability, you know, we often just try to provide information or evidence. So I love this sign from Canadian science protests in 2013, but I've seen it in many other protests since. The female scientist is saying, what do we want? Evidence-based decision-making. When do we want it? After peer review. <laughs> so that's our approach to the, um, the mission, right, of sustainability. We'll provide evidence. 
And I think when I asked environmental scientists what are effective ways to communicate and to achieve sustainability, you know, they listed a range of um, scientific uh, communication techniques, like newsletters, the website, the conversation, or skeptical science, and these Australian television channels, ABC and SBS, both of which put forward science shows. But these, of course, are effective in the sense that they have great content, but not necessarily effective in the sense that they convince new audiences. The people that watch science shows are often not really the target audience for some of the messages that we want to get across. I think scientists typically see themselves as up the extreme left. I'm going to try and woohoo. And um, up the extreme left of this continuum, which flows from a new idea down to social transformation, where like an inventor or an artist or another creative person, we come up with something awesome. And then that sort of trickles down through opinion leaders and community groups, and then political partisanship um, helped by opportunists. And then eventually, somehow, in some fuzzy way, there's changes to the laws and it becomes mainstream. If we were pushed a little bit further, I think most of us would have a vision that our stuff is going to be transmitted through social networks. So I learn something as a group conflict researcher, and I say it to you as an environmental psychologist. You hear me as an environmental psychologist, and then you take that back to cognitive psych, to psychology in Spain, or psychology elsewhere. So that's how the information is going to be transmitted, that I tell you that's going to save the world. And there's other people in other fields that might use news, or perhaps they use commercial marketing, but the general idea is this is sort of trickle through networks. But what about the end of the world? The end of the world, what end of the world? This is some of my favorite data on the limits of information transition. This is from uh, the Washington Post in 2014, and the data comes from the Public Religious Research Institute, PRRI. And the, up the top it says, the severity of recent natural disasters is evidence of, and the green bars say global climate change, and the brown bars say what the Bible calls the end times. Now some of you might be thinking to yourself, the end times? What are the end times? The end times is when the Christian God is going to afflict the earth with a series of disasters, followed by casting the unsaved to damnation and lifting up the saved to heaven. So what we can see here is that large minorities of, uh, sorry, large majorities of the American sample are seeing that natural disasters are evidence that uh, the end times are upon us and God is making ready to destroy the earth. Now that would affect your motivation to try and delay, and even your, your perception of the desirability of delaying or mitigating climate change, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. That's one point. But here's the other point that I want you guys to understand. I've just told you that some people think that these disasters are evidence of the end times. Did that change your view? Has that persuaded anyone in this room? Do you suddenly feel like your mind is open to that? I would put it to you, no. And no matter how many times I repeat that message, that these disasters are evidence of the biblical end times, you're not going to change. Now, why is that? It's a very simple and important point. We are protected against contamination by crazy ideas by the groups and the identities that we have. We're only trusting, we're only open of information within the boundaries of groups. So what we have seen with climate change communication over the last few years has been a very successful dissemination to the limits of our trust network, right? We have, we have really filled almost every area that scientists can reach with this mobilizing information about climate change. But what's missing? <clears throat> In this grip model, getting a grip, I'm gonna say there are three things that we need to do and we'll go through each of them in turn. First, we need to focus now on groups, not individuals. So what does that mean? Well, when we think about science communication and persuasion, all our environmental attitudes, I'm going to argue to you, like most environmental attitudes and behavior, are group normative. So this could be taken directly from Emo's um, talk, only his slides were prettier and his communication was punchier. Now, I won't self-handicap. I'll say I'm more awesome. <laughs> um, what we're trying to say is today an environmentalist might be someone that has a hybrid car and that votes to support, let's say, um, charges for renewable energy. 20 years ago, an environmentalist was someone that recycled. And 20 years from now, an environmentalist is going to look different again. 
So what it means to be an environmentalist changes based on group norms. That's one issue that's not as serious. A more serious one is that environmental uh, information has become associated with partisan identities. It's been associated with left-wing identities. That's true in Australia, it's true in the US, it's true in the UK, and I think it's true in Europe as well. As soon as we literally have green parties, we have the idea that some parties are ungreen. What does that mean? It means, unfortunately, some people are immune to our messages, hostile to our messages. So when we see um, graphics like this that illustrate the Twitter space and how left-wing people communicate mostly to each other and right-wing people communicate mostly to each other, these are American data with Republican Democrat, um, not by me, by another lab. Sorry, I didn't put that on the screen. But it's in the slides. Um, so when we look at these slides, what it's highlighting is that all of our information is going to be disseminating within networks and bounded by networks that are uh, partisan politically. And that's a problem for us as we start thinking about how we can achieve social transformation that doesn't get repealed. We can't have a situation where President Obama takes us into the Paris Treaty, but then President Trump takes us out. We can't have a situation like in Australia where Julia Gillard implements a carbon policy and then the next uh, conservative leader takes them out. But that is what we have now. We have a pendulum swing where left-wing parties are trying to implement sustainable transformation, and many right-wing parties, but not all, are trying to resist that. Now, how do we get into this situation when the environment is so patently not just about a narrow political ideology, when it's so much more? Well, I'm going to say to you that there is a substantial body of research, some of them by people in this room and some by people in my lab, that highlights that environmental messages can actually help to create that polarization, help to create situations where more right-wing people, more populist people, are ungreen. Some of the negative tactics um, are when we, we imply that our political opponents are all non-environmentalists, when we imply that other people won't listen to us because of their conflicting identities, which becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, when we attack certain people and that makes them look more legitimate to their own side, okay, makes them look more tough, so President Trump gains some credibility in some cases by some uh, attacks, and when, on the contrary, some people who are trying to be agents of change in the center are attacked because their measures are inadequate and um, half measures. All right, I hope that you've been, you've been persuaded. I see some frowns. You're thinking about this. This is plausible, okay? So then what? <clears throat> well, you know, maybe we should just do the same thing more so. So this is from the midterm elections in President Obama's second term, 2014. This was when the Republicans gained control of both the House of Representatives and the Senate. So reflecting on this, Michael Brune, the executive director of the Sierra Club, was interviewed in a left-wing paper, the Huffington Post. And he said, look, you know, in some ways, uh, 2014 was a success. It elevated the issue of climate change generally. It made the candidates in a number of key races change the way they talked. But when it comes to electing a slate of pro-environmental candidates, on which environmental groups spent an unprecedented amount of money, on that, Brune said, there's been a miserable failure. Okay, a Republican who wrote a book about climate change denial took over the committee um, for the environmental panel. That was a disaster. Well, what happens next? You know, Elizabeth Thompson, the director of the Sierra Club's political arm, was saying, you know, this, this wasn't a referendum on the climate in 2014. It was just a bad day for the Democrats. We spent 85 million as environmental groups, and you know what the problem was? It was just too low. So what's the solution? Well, we need more resources, and we need to keep doing what we're doing more intensely. Well, how is that working? 2016, the Republicans had control of the House, they had control of the Senate, and they have a president who's been dismantling the EPA. There are very serious consequences of our failure to engage with right-wing people. And a partisan approach to politics is natural. Sorry, just flipping forward. Partisan uh, approach to politics is natural. It has many virtues and purposes. I'm not saying there shouldn't be a green party or green voters. I am one myself, a green voter in Australia. But what I am saying is, to the extent that the environment needs to have bipartisan support, we can't just approach it as a partisan issue. Okay. 
Now, if we're scientists and we're saying, let's take this leap of faith, let's have evidence-based political action. Let's just try and do things that actually work. Let's, let's stop doing things that don't work. What would be a problem or an issue with that? Well, part of the problem or the issues is that scientists are not actually engaging group conflict at all around the environment. I shouldn't say that. There's people in this room that are doing it, and so have I. But we're dropping the ocean, right? Most people that are looking at environmental psychology are focusing on individuals. Some people that are looking at environmental groups tend to look at pro-environmental identities. There has been so little work on resistance to the environment or disregard of the environment. We have lots of studies on biospheric values and how it's correlated with X, Y, and Z, but can we understand why egoistic values are not associated with environmental action when environmental action, in fact, is affecting more and more people? So there's this asymmetry between um, where we are studying individuals and pro-environmental groups and where the obstacles are with anti-environmental groups. That's what we need to address as scientists. And we need to address this both in the short and the long term. So in other words, while Republicans are in power, or while conservatives are in power in Europe, where um, center parties are in power, we need to understand what's stopping them but we also need to make sure that we have a bipartisan consensus in future. Okay, there are many emotional blocks to this, so let's try and take a moment to understand, maybe some of you don't need this, but I know many of you would, that conservatives can be part of a solution. First, all the major human thrashing of the planet or trashing of the planet has been bipartisan. Meat, travel, fossil fuel use, it's not just right-wing people that are susceptible to that. Five years after both sides will have committed to bipartisan environmental policies, um, like for example, uh, certain pollution laws have bipartisan support, that's where we need to imagine ourselves and then try and get there really quickly. Rather than dealing with where we are now, where there's partisan divides, we need to imagine that future where we have bipartisan support. And as many religions have said, um, and, and it's as psychologists would say to parents or teachers, it's possible to divorce problem behavior from the persons. Now, I know this is very difficult. Recently, I gave this a similar talk in the, um, to an American audience, and one of the people came up to me afterwards and says, what you don't understand is that Republicans have sold their soul to the devil. <laughs> and I thought, oh, she wasn't kidding. <laughs> and, um, I thought, well, I understand the degree of frustration that people are feeling, and the next part of my talk is about environmental radicalization and how it's happening, but we need to be aware of what the consequences are of that approach. I think it is possible, and psychologists tell us that it is effective in behavior change to try and create a behavior change message that doesn't involve stigmatizing our opponents, but rather engaging with negative norms, toxic behaviors, and trying to create a culture of change. Having said that, the evidence basis is really limited, so I'm going to accept that, right? If I knew what would work, I wouldn't be here talking to you, I'd be out doing it. But I do know some of the things that work, and I'm going to be focusing on that in the rest of the talk. So we need to define the groups inclusively in a way that minimizes the problem. Here's an, a, an illustration of what I think people shouldn't do that'll be easy for you guys to understand to the extent that you know, you've seen this dynamic in right-wing people in your own political space. Let's say that we have a very serious problem with terrorists, let's say with Islamic terrorists. Let's say that there's been hideous violence that affects people, that, that lies heavy on the hearts of people in a particular country like Spain. And these terrorists claim that they represent people who have a particular political stance, like opposing the bombing in Syria, or perhaps opposing um, Western bases in Saudi Arabia. And in turn, the political opponents claim to speak about a huge passive constituency, all Muslims, or perhaps all people in the Middle East. Once we realize that we have a problem group, like Islamic terrorists, how common is it for authorities to draw a line between themselves and the entire broadest community? It's very common. Say we have a problem with Islam, we have a problem with Muslims. Now, what that does, of course, is problematic on two levels. Firstly, you've given the terrorists what they illegitimately claimed. They are not the leaders of the whole constituency. They're a despised minority on the margins. But second, you've created the us-them, which reduces trust and openness. Now your whole message is less effective. So what do you need to do? 
Well, you need to define an inclusive target audience in which you are part of that broader group. There are lots of people, tens of thousands of people in Europe, in Australia, in the US that are concerned about the bombings in Syria or that are opposed to policies of the West and the Middle East. But you know what we don't want? We don't want to see faith-based war spread throughout the world with innocent victims and body parts scattered in the road and people afraid and attacked on holidays. That's what we have in common. So that's the target audience that we're talking to, people that are aware of a problem looking for a solution. Now, there's lots of rhetoric and psychology in the group processes space that we could spend time on, but we won't do that now because um, I only have a few minutes for this talk. Okay, that's easy to identify because those were right-wing people making that mistake. But if we start from the assumption that environmental behavior requires a sympathetic identity, let's imagine how green activists and even green scientists sometimes work to develop that identity. Let's imagine we're concerned about fossil fuel use in particular. And many people consciously use fossil fuels like when they drive cars. But of course, all of us use fossil fuels to support our lifestyle and society. We're all part of this problem. Well, how common is it for environmental messages to be communicated about the problem society as a whole, Westerners as a whole? It's very common. And what is the effect? The people in the target audience become alienated. The trust and openness is reduced. Greenies seem like they're out of touch. They're literally opposed to everyone in the world. What is the alternative that we should be doing? We should be dividing and conquering. We include our target audience in our messages with us. Everyone driving a car has identified the possible problems. Most people would flick a switch if they could, if they could flick a switch right now and change the fuel from fossil fuels to something else that worked, they would do it. So they know there's a problem and they're looking for a solution. And that's the basis for our approach to them. The other thing that I think is really easy and strangely neglected is to prioritize the positive message of change rather than the negative present. So I'll just flip on. Yesterday in the talk, um, Emo was introducing Cialdini's ideas of descriptive norms and injunctive norms. Descriptive norms, what people actually do, and injunctive norms, what people think should be done. A lot of my work with Joe Smith has highlighted that if you put those two things together, there's often interactions that are found. So let's look at these posters. These are typical posters in behavior change and political climate. They oppose the injunctive to the descriptive norm. We see stop trashing the climate, an injunctive message, with a descriptive norm, which is suggesting people are trashing the climate. Here we see one European week for waste reduction, right? The injunctive norm, we should reduce waste. But that means 51 weeks of the year we don't, right? So it's very common in behavior change. It's very common in political contests. And it's common in health, generally, to put these two things against each other. Well, as scientists, we can ask, does that actually work? Does it actually increase intentions? And you know what? The answer is no. Other people in this room have shown that. Here's some studies from my lab. Oh, sorry, and it's not just in the environment space. It's also in many other areas from obesity, right? It's a national epidemic. People should eat more healthily. Sun protection, guns, right? Here we see a picture of heaps of guns, and we say these, we shouldn't have all these guns. So it's very common to put this forward. Here are the top three posters that you find if you search on Google um, for environmental posters activism. And here are some posters that come up for environmental posters social change. They all highlight the problem. OK, so here's a paper in JEP that Joanne Smith and I did. We showed that not only does saying that something is common and shouldn't be done not increase action, it significantly decreases it. Is that what you were trying to do with your message? No? Well, maybe we shouldn't do it anymore then. Here's the health space. Exposing participants to messages about positive support for healthy eating weekly increases intentions, the dotted line. But if there's a negative descriptive norm present, not only does it not increase, it significantly decreases. Significantly decreases. Is that what you were trying to do? Here's another one from Kelly Fielding and Rachel McDonald and I, three studies. What we're seeing here is people thinking about how some groups in society are good and some are bad on the environment. Maybe my family and my workplace are environmental and my country is bad. Maybe my country's green, but my family's more um, conservative. When you reflect on that, some people who already have strong favorable attitudes are energized, these green lines, but are they the target audience of any campaign? Are you targeting people with strong favorable attitudes? No. 
So we can ask, what happens if you don't have strong favorable attitudes and you reflect on the diversity of climate behavior? Not only does action not go up, it significantly goes down. So I think that these messages in my papers, in the papers of other people, are consistent enough that they should be engaged. Why do we keep doing it? Well, we're the people with strong favorable attitudes. We're designing campaigns that motivate ourselves. And psychologists are doing the same thing. They're designing studies with interventions and testing them, the ones that would work for me. If I saw this message, I would be mobilized, right? And then what happens? <clears throat> well, I think there are three alternative things that we could do. Two of them work um, effectively, and one of them is counterproductive. I'll leave it to you to guess which is counterproductive. <laughs> I won't leave you for long, though. The people that are most persuasive on in the environment are people who are within the conservative community. In Australia, farmers have been an incredibly important force for change in the last few years. I believe that's true in the US and it's true in Europe. So things like food security can be a good way of communicating positive environmental messages in a context where politicians will be motivated. Here in Australia, we're talking about a campaign against coal seam gas extraction, which is colloquially called fracking. Now, who are the, why is that campaign successful, leading to a moratorium on fracking in many Australian states? Because it was led by conservatives, i.e. led by farmers. Now, it's, they're not just conservatives, they're conservatives in marginal rural electorates, right? But some of these guys are in safe conservative seats. They're still politically important. Another tactic that often works is what I'm calling chain of trust. That's when you realize nobody's going to listen to me because I'm too green or I'm a scientist and nobody believes scientists. After all, we're biased, right? So I'm going to give the message to someone else that is still trusted by the target audience, like doctors. We've seen a lot of successful advocacy by doctors around the health effects of climate change. Why is that? I would argue it's because that these people are closer in the chain of trust to the target audience that we're trying to influence. And the same thing is true of other groups like insurance companies. They're able to be more persuasive because they're closer to the business community. <laughs> now, what do activists often choose instead? Well, they choose a contest for power. They want to defeat their political opponents and, and express their rejection of them. Of course, that's morally OK and often fun. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. But it does have a problem, and that is counter-mobilization. So to the extent that this approach um, leads people to push back against the environmental message, then it's not, just count it's not just ineffective, it's counterproductive. So two of the, audience, of the tactics work for the target audiences, and one of them works more psychologically for activists. What are the needs that it's filling? How can we understand the radicalization of the green movement in our different countries? Well, the work that I did in my PhD before I looked at the environment was around political violence and political choices. And a lot of my work has looked at that in different contexts, like anti-racism or um, English-French conflict in Quebec and so on. This is work that I've done with Don Taylor, my PhD advisor, and then lately with Emma Thomas, a colleague at um, the University of Flinders. Attacks on your enemies serve two of the four functions identified by Hornsey et al. for political behavior. They express your values, and arguably and often, they help to build an oppositional movement. What they don't do is mobilize third parties and change public opinion and positively affect policymakers. Now, I say that, and there's lots of nuance and contest, but um, I think the data are pretty clear, and I'm happy to argue with you about that over lunch. For now, I'll just show you one of the studies um, in this line of work, I think two studies, with Thomas and Lewis. So we were looking at anti-fracking activism and anti-whaling activism in two studies. And we asked people um, to read a newspaper report which was describing violent or nonviolent actions. And to make a long story short, it was nonviolent actions that were more effective in persuading people about the cause. And in particular, it helped them, the readers, to believe in the illegitimacy of this, the issue that is whaling or fracking and to believe in the power of the group to achieve change. Now, this was the case as long as the system wasn't seen as corrupt. Among people who saw the decision-making system as corrupt, violent and nonviolent tactics were seen as were equally ineffective. So I think there's lots to talk about there. I'm just going to press on. 
When we look at what predicts support for violence among activists, group discussions of the illegitimacy of the situation and the failure of past action are a trigger of that. So when we look at why environmentalists are so angry, so frustrated, it's a history of the failure of conventional action over the last 30 years to achieve swift enough change, in part. And we can see that same dynamic in our political opponents. Why are right-wing populists emerging? Why are people prepared to support some crazy racists or um, crazy rich business people like Trump? The repeated experience of failure within the conventional system is part of the transition towards radicalization. So that's the stuff that I'm studying in my latest work, which is with Emma Thomas, Craig McGarty, Catherine Amio, and Vitaly Mogadam, as well as some students, Tim, Grace, and Joshua. And this work is about the emergence of radical action on right-wing and left-wing uh, political issues. The model proposes that when people experience success based on conventional action, they tend to keep doing it. But if they don't, you see a suite of outcomes, which I'm calling the dime variables. Now, these variables are different from each other. Among some of the respondents, when they've tried, say, going to a rally or Earth Hour and nothing's happening, they just say, oh, it's too hard. It's not worth it anyways. They disidentify and they exit. Among other people, they say, well, that didn't work. Let's try something new. And that's the context, I think, for the emerging radicalization on both um, right-wing and left-wing voters in Europe and elsewhere. And then there are a group of people that just keep doing the same thing, only with more and more moral urgency and energy, the idea that you know, we really need to act. And I think that sense of moral urgency and frustrated energy is apparent across the environmental um, action. And many environmental psychologists show this as well, right? Okay, here are two studies that, that demonstrate um, these effects in the anti coal seam gas movement. So this is with my honor student Grace Davies last year. In each case, participants are screened to be sympathizers. So if you were right wing, um, you're excluded uh, from the study. So P people are asked to imagine participating in a protest which is conventional or radical and that succeeds or fails in getting the local town council to take a stand against coal seam gas. The question is, what happens next? Okay. What we see is in two samples uh, that were collected, one sample of around 200 American m turkers and another sample of around 150 Australian students, the American m turkers were more mobilized by conventional action. So when they read about environmentalists who are conventional, they show greater intentions to engage in conventional action, like petitions and rallies and donating themselves. Interestingly, the Australian students were more mobilized by radical action. When they read about radical action, they were more likely to engage in conventional action and radical action, like chaining yourself to gates is the big thing to do in anti-fracking, and even to break the law. So these important effects are in opposite directions for reasons that uh, neither group psychology um, nor um, individual differences psychology can clearly explain, although I could take a crack at it, right? There's also a success effect for the students only. When they failed, they were more likely to try different strategies in the next round. And there are important interactions on variables that frankly we didn't expect, like support for democracy and law breaking. So this is the interaction for support for democracy. When the um, respondents saw conventional action, its success or failure didn't alter how they felt about the democracy in their country. But if they were exposed to environmental action that was radical and that failed, they actually showed lower support for democracy subsequently. Now this is a scale from one to nine, and what we're seeing is the top half. So we're still safely in the pro-democracy camp, but it completely blew me away that you could lower someone's support for democracy based on this incidental um, protest outcome. And I think that this kind of a, a phenomenon highlights how vital it is for people in a wide variety of spaces, but including the environment, to start looking at how people respond to protests, how people are responding to political protest for the environment. Because the effects are understudied, the effects of failure are complex and important, and they are appearing on variables like radicalization and support for democracy, 
that affect us all. I think that the contradiction in the DIME model, these divergent outcomes, explains the paradox that many of us have seen in society, where on the one hand we see unprecedented disasters, and on the one hand we've, ne we've seen that our society has never been more active. There are more environmental activists than ever before. So at the same time as we have increasing authoritarianism, we see increasing mobilization against that. Okay, what's my conclusion? <clears throat> well, what we know so far is that our messages of sustainability have had a number of positive effects. You know, they've really gotten out to our side of the Twitterverse, they've gotten out through our networks, and almost everyone on the left is, believes in climate change and the importance of action. What we are failing to do is break through the center to the other side of politics. And because of that, we're unable to introduce sustainable policy change. So for us to achieve sustainable policy change, our campaign designers need to understand the evidence of, suggests that what they're doing is not working. But for that to happen, scientists are needed because the data simply isn't there to highlight the important moderators that are creating backlash effects throughout our um, studies. If I put up again a slide, I should say, here I tokenly acknowledge the work of other people, something I've conspicuously not done throughout the talk. There's important work by Steg, um, by Haidt, by um, Fielding and Hornsey, by Sarah Dolnikar, that speaks to some of the processes with conservatives. And I see this work as vitally important. The idea of backlashes has started to be documented in numbers of labs, including by people in this room. But we need so much more of this. We need to understand the backlash, which is so socially consequential. We need to understand active resistance, which is so socially consequential. And we're not systematically addressing it as a field. It's really unclear when environmental communication and advocacy will work awesomely, except that if we have insiders speaking to the open, trusting audience, that always works. So what we can do in the absence of that is really unclear. Okay, this is the slide I started with, and I'd like to draw your attention to this last one, what we can do as scientists. And I'm going to elaborate it now in my final slide, so in an ideal world we'll even have time for questions despite starting late. This is my to-do list for transformative environmental science. When people use convenient samples of students, we're not really getting our problem people into the lab. When people use surveys disseminated through social media or other environmental networks, we're not getting our problem people into the lab. We have to actively search for conservatives. If you're going to study them, it won't happen by accident. So on top of the list of the to-do for transformative environmental science, is to understand the environmental behavior of people who don't care about the environment. The people with hedonic values, with egoistic values. Is there anything that gets them to care about the environment? That's what we need to know. And related to that, we shouldn't pathologize these people. Um, it's hard because it's you know, psychologically fun and natural. But of course, people are right wing for any of a variety of reasons. And if we don't understand that and we're psychologists, who will? Right? So we have to challenge ourselves in some of the language and talk, the way we describe people who are not into the environment, and try very hard not to describe them in negative, judgmental ways. I think a lot of you already have data where political orientation and age, which is correlated with political orientation, was collected. And you can look at that moderation. And I would love it if people would publish the variables and findings that don't work so I could facilitate that on my own blog, but I would really love to see some sort of institutional commitment from IAAP or from the journals, where it could simply be that if you're an author and you've published in a journal, especially in the old days, right, where there's such strong pressure for selective reporting, you can't put the variables that don't work into your papers. You can't put the studies that don't work into your papers. Now, the door is opening now, but for many years that door was firmly closed. So if journals would allow the authors to just simply report the variables, the context where what they study doesn't work, that would allow us to move forward much more quickly as a field. OK. Um, and related to this, as a reviewer and as an editor, it is so important that we start allowing the null findings to be published. I think that environmental psychologists do much better than so many other areas of psychology where there's a strong replicability crisis. I think I see in our field a comparative openness to null findings. 
But still, it's the case, and I know I've experienced this as an author. I know most of the people in this room, if they're senior, have experienced this. We tend to just file drawer the studies that show interventions that don't work and situations where things don't work. We have to stop doing that because that's the problem that we need to solve. So I'm going to stop there and say thank you for your attention. I want you to know I cut 10 minutes from that talk. Um, I hope it wasn't too apparent. <laughs> Am I live? Okay. Maybe if I get close. There we go. Uh, so we do have a few minutes uh, to take some questions. Yes? Um, I was wondering if you know of the research of uh, John Jost. Yes. Rina Fagina on system justification, because it, yeah. it directly relates to this in terms of uh, Fagina's uh, dissertation was on how to change messaging specifically to get people on the right to respond more directly. OK. Um, I haven't actually seen that work if it's shown something that worked. I have seen a few papers from John Jost's lab. I guess I would say I love that line of work, and I respect John Jost very deeply. But I think that he could probably be put into the camp of people that are pathologizing right w the right wing. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, you know, system justification is real. I don't dispute it. But I think that, um, and I'm very interested, and I will follow up his students' work if he's shown ways of framing that, that work well on the right. I think that's vital. But I do think we need to, to um, do more of that work and to communicate it in ways that respects the morality, competence, and intelligence of right-wing voters. And, and basically, her dissertation was saying, instead of saying if people were afraid that the environmental movement was attacking capitalism and attacking uh, attacking social value saying, no, that's, we need the environmental change in order to protect the economy. First. Yeah, that's right. That, that's a positive. I never thought I would say this, you know, when I, a few years ago when um, Arnold Schwarzenegger was the Republican uh, governor of California, but I really admired Arnold Schwarzenegger's response to Trump's pulling out of the climate, um, Paris Climate Accord. So I don't know how many of you have had a chance to look at that. But it's an example of how you can articulate a right-wing perspective on the environment in a way that's persuasive. And um, again, I don't want to dispute the idea that some people in this room want to destroy global capitalism. I, too, in my dreams, would flick that switch. But what I want to say is that um, there are a lot of people that are um, believing in the environment and believing in capitalism. And we need to empower those voices because they actually could help to prevent the backlash that's what I'm trying to say. Thank you for your comment and question. Other questions? Right behind you, yeah. Thank you. Really enjoyed that. Thank you. And, uh, you know, particularly the final slide where you basically have a call to action. Um, Great. Two things resonated with me. I just want to mention briefly. Um, one is the avoidance of pathologizing uh, people who have views different from your own. Yeah. Uh, so my research has been about NIMBY problems, and it's very easy to say that people who are opposed to renewable energy uh, devices are somehow deficient and yeah. uh, difficult in some way. And I think we, we have to realize as a community of researchers that our actions have political implications and yeah. are part of a political context, and, and the words that we use or the way we see participants are very important, so I would back that up. The other thing is the, the, your call to be careful about who your participants are, which resonates with me particularly as well. I, I don't really understand the value of, of convenient samples, you know, ad infinitum being used as the participants in our studies. Yeah. Um, now, what I wanted to ask you a question about was the way I've got around that is, is focusing on representativeness rather than convenience and uh, using the device of financial incentives as a means of bringing people into the research who aren't interested in scientific research generally or even interested in the problem. Yeah. I was just wondering whether you think that is one method of getting around the issue of only um, relying on people who are already interested in a topic or, or have similar views to be prepared to fill out a survey or take part in a focus group. Whether, what do you yeah. think that works? I think representative samples and financial incentives are great, especially for people with grants. For those of us that don't always have grants, I think a convenient sample of engineering students would make a nice change from a convenient sample of psychologists, or a convenient sample of business and law students could even help to remedy some of the gaps. I think no one, very few psychologists are ideologically wedded to student samples, but a number of people use them because they're cheap. You know, you can access a bunch of engineers with a chocolate bar and a friendly RA, 
or a bunch of business students with a friendly RA and some sort of bright, shiny sticker. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But if we think, if we start to realize there's a problem, you know, I think we do have creative solutions and we can study different populations than the ones that we normally do. I, thanks for your comment. Okay, maybe one more question. You speak about uh, that uh, as a, one of your recommendations is do not uh, demonize the opponents. Yeah. So how to compatibilize this, uh, this recommendation when you see that the the party in the government is reducing the budget for climate change yeah. 40 or 50 percent. I know. For example, this year in Spain. I know, yeah. How do we process the anger and moral outrage that we feel when we see, for example, in Spain here, that the funding for the environment has been eliminated or cut by 50 percent? And of course, in the American context, we've literally seen anti-pollution inspectors fired and scientists instructed to suppress their data. How do we suppress our moral outrage? I mean, I guess I would say that in the literature on persuasion, there's very little to suggest that shouting at someone and identifying them as demon spawn works very well. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't express our moral outrage through political action and by mobilizing, we should. But at the same time, the environment is more than just the politics. And all of the stuff around meat, travel, fossil fuels, our whole society has been to blame. You know, some of the, um, in, in many contexts like Australia, richer people are more likely to be left, but rich people are the disproportionate ones that are creating problems. So if we have a sense of well-directed moral rage that is channeled into political advocacy, at the same time as we're able to separate people's problem behavior from their personal worth and to imagine the possibility of change, I think that's our solution. We know that they've gone worse in the last five years, right? In the Republican case and in the European case, the right-wing people have gotten dramatically worse in the last five years in terms of their ideological hostility to the environment. So if they can get worse, they can get better, right? The people that, the polarization processes that have allowed these extremists to capture their movements those polarization processes created swift change. That means a swift backlash is possible. And we have seen this in other previous contexts. We have seen um, right-wing parties turn suddenly on each other, like the Tea Party in the US, right? Suddenly replaced by Trump. So if we imagine that our goal is to help reverse the swift deterioration on the right wing, or perhaps the longer term trajectory, then that is keeping us focused with a change mentality rather than imagining that our opponents cannot change and we have to destroy them. And I believe that we can't destroy them, and I believe that we have to change them. So that's my response. But I totally respect the um, anger that everyone feels. I do feel it myself, in case there's any doubt. I just conceal it under my Canadian banter. Yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you very much for your attention. And thank you. Thank you to one of you. Thank you.